and welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Bud Elliott. I'm Chip Patterson coming to you live at youtube.com slash cover3 and everywhere you get your podcasts on demand. Thanks for hanging out. Smash that subscribe. Smash that like and come and join us in the chat, a.k.a. the Cover 3 tailgate. And you see those sirens in your feed. You know exactly what that means. But we've got the final stages of the Texas A&M head coaching search, a search that we thought was going to be decided on Saturday night. And we'll get to a, a quick refresh of how we got here with Mark Stoops and then not with Mark Stoops as more reporting has illuminated us as to what exactly happened behind the scenes. But currently multiple reports, you know, um, Houston Chronicle, Yahoo Sports, the indication is that Texas A&M uh, has picked Duke's Mike Elko, the former Texas A&M defensive coordinator with two very good years at Duke to be the next head coach. There is, you know, what happens to Elijah Robinson as he was a, a candidate for the job as well there in the uh, in the final stages. And what does the staff look like? What happens at Duke? Lots to get to as we unpack this. But for a Texas A&M job that we've been discussing a lot, um, what do you think the, the future looks like with Mike Elko? I to quote Tom Fernelli, that's a great hire. I have no idea if it will work out, right? <laughs> I, I do think we're kind of uniquely qualified to discuss this uh, among some of the national guys because we're both ACC dudes at heart, right? Like right. We, we've seen a lot of Elko. We talked to a lot of people both with, within the league and within the triangle. And like I, I have probably watched every Duke game that he's coached, or at least all, all, all of the conference games and a, and a couple of the non conference. I think Mike Elko is a good football coach, guys. I, I think he knows what he's doing. If you are Texas A&M, um, you probably should have superior knowledge about what he was inside of your building. My guess here is that there are people at A&M who said, oh, no, when Elko left, things really started to fall apart internally. And it, it may be a blinding flash to the obvious that Elko was the thing holding to the Aggies together from mm. 2018 to 2021. He did a good job as a defensive coordinator there. I do think he's a solid recruiter. He clearly recruited, at least in part, some of the pieces that are now upperclassmen on this team, which will be pretty important, Chip, as the transfer portal opens on December 4th to try to keep all those guys there uh, in College Station. And yet I can also tell you, like, he only has two years as a head coach. Mm. Uh, a lot of his record was on the back of having a really good quarterback that will be, one if he transfers from Duke, one of the hottest commodities in the transfer portal in, in Riley Leonard. And I mean, did you not just get a cheaper version of Mark Stoops? Not there's anything wrong with that, right? Like th this could be a cost saving measure for AM. Would you have, would you rather have Elko than Mark Stoops or would you rather have Mark Stoops than Mike Elko? If I'm making like a blind decision, right. probably, probably Stoops, but AM is not blind in this because they do know what it is like to employ Mike Elko. So they right. should have the superior knowledge. And yet, clearly, Elko was not their first choice. There, there are many other guys who said, no, we're, we're good, and probably didn't make it to the interview stage. And then they went after Stoops. It appeared last night that, that like they had offered Stoops. Stoops had agreed. Some other power brokers there said, no, and we want Elko, or maybe the Elijah Robinson thing, which that would have been wild. Um and so they went and hired Elko. Like this does feel like a little bit of a cost saving thing. But if you think about what Stoops makes at, at, at Kentucky, like Chip, think about how much money they would have had to pay to get him out of there. Oh, Elko feels much cheaper to me. Mm, I can't. I mean, it, it is probably not what the Kentucky football coach, especially Mark Stoops. I I don't know, but Duke usually is pretty um, is not cheap. Duke normally is able to, you know, like in private school, so we're never going to know exactly what that contract looks like. But it's, uh, do you think that at the beginning of this, uh, Mike Elko, because he was a former defensive coordinator, um, he was always going to be on the list. And I even said, I, I didn't see it, that I thought that this Ivy League educated guy from Jersey you know, who has, you know, come up through the ranks. I, I thought that he had found a spot at Duke where he could really put a plan in place and really start to see, you know, what it's going to look like to 
go not just two years, but four years, six years, you know, really start to build that thing out utilize the transfer portal the way he did to go get like miles jones and al blades you know pick up a couple pieces on the lines of scrimmage as well but you know uh, going into college station and just sort of being in that that in intense environment around texas a m football I, I misread you know what mike elko wants to do so they you know he is going to know what it's like at College Station better than I am, clearly, from having been there for all that time. Are, are you surprised that Elko ends up jumping uh, at this opportunity? Um, A, a little bit. He, he had made some noise about the craziness of the transfer portal, and, and I think that there is a, a drumbeat among the bottom half programs, I'm not saying teams, programs, within the, the ACC about like, hey, can we really compete in this NIL era? Right. I, I don't know if we can. Dino Babers made some comments about that. We saw the comments from Dave Clawson about Sam Hartman, however awkward they were, that they're like he's speaking from a, a place of honesty there as well. So I wonder like what Duke's NIL program is. Like, could they have kept Riley Leonard? If the answer is no, then yeah, Oko needed to jump. I I just wonder, like, hey, it was the discussion with, with the board really, man, no, Elko's such a better coach, or was it wait for the money? Do we really want to pay X for Mark Stoops or, you know, a lot cheaper, I think, for Elko? And the reason why I think it is cheaper, Chip, is because he's making so much money at Kentucky already. Like, to get him to leave that and that kind of guaranteed money, you just paid 76 to buy out Jimbo. I, I mean, that's probably – that has to be part of the discussion. Wait, we paid $76 million to go pay another 75 guaranteed for Mark Stoops? Well, that was the that was the signal they were sending. You know, don't, I mean, don't forget yeah, what was that? You to know it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they they wanted you to know it. Like all those reports, um, you know, from all the, all the great insiders were like, knowing that quote, money is no, ob like money is no obstacle. Like the, these are the names that we're going for. Um, Texas A&M wanted you to know it was ready to spend 150 million to be able to get this thing done. And maybe you don't have to do that with someone who just simply only has two years of head coaching experience. Like you're just your market value. Even if Duke is backing it up, I, I understand why you could look at it as the, the cost saving measure. Here's how I think it went down. Cause as we talked about on the instant reaction show last night, we had heard from, you know, all throughout this, that there were a lot of different power players around Texas A&M in this process. And that what was the line? It was like the, the hire will not be linear. I think that Stoops and Texas A&M thought they had it done. There are uh, reports that Stoops even started to tell people around him, like, yeah. hey, you know what? Like, this, this is happening. And it did not have board approval. And when they went to the board, I think that there are people who are on the board who are being influenced or they feel strongly themselves by the reaction I mean, it's it's very unfair of me, but it's very difficult to not feel as though Texas A&M uh, looked and saw the reaction to Stoops and then decided to to change their tone, even if they are getting a former defensive coordinator, a, like uh, somebody who's going to be a culture builder, and it's not going to is not coming with the kind of like home. It, he's not coming with the national championship ring that Jimbo Fisher had. Last time you hired Florida State's head coach, now you're hiring Duke's head coach. Completely. I, Although I, I'm more confident in Elko than I am Fisher. Right? I thought there was some chance that Fisher could work out at A&M, but he had major like personal stuff he had to get right. Yeah. You know, clearly, if you read the athletics post-mortem on his time there, he did not get those things right. He, he surrounded himself with yes-men uh, who, who, who would not like have the ability to talk to him and say, hey, man, like this – this is not going to work. This is not the right way to do things. This is not the right way to treat people. So, um, and well, Elko's the opposite of that. Yeah. Like I, I will speak like from my, uh, my hashtag local corner here, but like he is the way that he treats people, the kind of operation he runs, uh, players, staff, everybody has loved to be a part of that Duke program. I mean, just look at the fact that all the success has come with David Cutcliffe's players. I mentioned transfer portal additions, but you know, just all of a sudden, everything just flipped in terms of um, the way that they were playing, the way that they were competing. You know, th that had to be something that if I am passing along information to Texas A&M fans, he's going to be inheriting 
a somewhat fractured locker room and roster and trying to keep things together and going into a huge year where Texas is back in the conference. Like, I think that he will be able to in obviously inheriting a more talented roster. I think he will be able to at least pull that group together uh, in a way that will be incredibly beneficial for them to have instant results. They have, I, I think a lot to look forward to with, with, with Mike Elko. Like when, when I watch a Mike Elko team, I, I see a guy, uh, first of all, he's a defensive coach, but he does embrace offense. And I think that's really important, right? We, I don't put him in a must champ type category. Correct. Some of these defensive guys are, and I think that's really important because a, like you, in today's day and age, you can't just play defense. You have to play both sides of the ball. Kevin Johns is a proven good offensive coordinator hire for Elko. Like, yeah, you had a really good quarterback in Riley Leonard, but I see a guy that understands his personnel and empowers his team to go make plays and understands like he's going to use his playmakers in a way to really feature them, right? And like, look no further than that short rest game that Duke had when Riley Leonard was out and the backup Henry Bielen was out as well. Like, they found a way with a true freshman third string quarterback who really, like, let's be frank here, can't, can't really play or is not yet. He's not ready to play yet. And they found a way to make it work. And you could tell those Duke guys. They were still playing with confidence, with, with hair on fire. And like, like that's such a big part of it, man. Like figuring out what your guys can do, what they can handle, what your install is like during the week, your, your, your self-scout about it, and, then, and, and empowering your guys to go out and play with that confidence. I, like Elko's teams, and they, and they scrap. Like, yeah. they are, they're a pain in the ass to play. So I look, I think this is a good hire. We can say like a and might have gone cheap compared to the Stoops thing, but it doesn't mean they got a lesser guy. Like Elko is higher risk because he's less proven, but I think it's a good hire, man. Who knows if it'll work out? <laughs> we watched on Monday night of Labor Day weekend, and that Duke team came out with their hair on fire. They were as fast and as strong and hitting as hard as the Clemson Tigers. And it was so discombobulating, it nearly sent the Tiger season spiraling out of control. And I think it was, you know, just a, a, a great wake up call for um, what. How, how much can be accomplished in terms of having your group mentally prepared it, when that goes into the game planning that goes into just the very simple coaching motivation stuff. Um, it's just a Elko checks a lot of boxes there. You mentioned, I do think a lot of Texas A&M fans probably are going to be looking at the offensive coordinator higher. Like that's one of the comments in the cover three tailgate I'm seeing right now is like, could be really good needs to nail the OC higher could be really good needs to nail the OC higher in modern football. When you make this kind of higher, that's going to be one thing that's going to be really important to the fans. Do you think that you just go with Kevin Johns? Like, do you think you try to bring him over from Duke, or is this a situation where, because you're dealing with an assistant pool of Texas A&M, that you know maybe you end up looking elsewhere and trying to uh, to make an outside hire from not with your staff? I I hope A&M doesn't try to sort of A&M this right to where like, are you have to go get a splashier name? I, I think Kevin Johns can really coach offense. I agree. So now that's assuming he doesn't get the Duke job, which we'll get to. I I, I assume that he would, you know, potentially. Uh, be up for it, but um, no, I, I think Elko has shown that that he understands the importance of playing offense. What you don't want to do is do like what Florida did to Muschamp, which was like they made him go hire Charlie Weiss, I think, because he was a, a newish head coach, didn't have a lot of experience, and that was just an absolute disaster. Um, and I think Muschamp would have probably told you that. You know, I, I don't think that's a guy he wanted to hire uh, if, if if you give him the truth serum there. So hopefully, A and just lets Elko make the pick and understands it is important to, to play offense. I, they'll have some money to throw around, I assume, because it, and I doubt they're going to pay Elko like $10 million a year, right? The guy Correct. has two years of head coaching experience, probably more in that, what, like eight? Seven? No, I listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Texas, Texas A&M is in the seven to eight floor. Now, sure. it's so funny that there's not that much gap, really, when we're talking about this much money, I guess, between eight and 10. But you look at the names and where they're ranked on that list, there's a difference between eight and 10. Anybody who's got one of these jobs can go out there and make seven, $8 million a year, but yeah. 10 is reserved for the people that are competing for championships. I believe they have a, a pretty reasonable schedule too, right? Like, so the expectation will be to, to win. I think immediately, right? Looking here at, at their schedule. Um, I, I looked at this earlier, I think 2024 football schedule for the Aggies. So, 
Notre Dame at home to start the year. Okay. And then McNeese, Bowling Green, New Mexico State, and uh, Arkansas at the neutral, uh, Auburn, Florida, Mississippi State, South Carolina, LSU, Missouri, Texas. There's no Bama. There's no Georgia on that schedule. There's no Tennessee, right? Like, I would project Auburn to be pretty improved. Missouri's probably not a huge backslide. I assume Texas will still be a really good football team. Uh, but, uh, I mean, by the way, that's a theory that in the divisionless era, and I know that you've always been dialed into schedules, but like, because that's huge in the gambling world. It's why you saw Louisville's odds and win totals not line up with the media's order of finish. When they every all the writers get together for ACC media days, not a lot of them are keeping their eyes on the odds board, and that's why you see Louisville projected to finish seventh, while the odds have Louisville as you know possibly an ACC championship pick. It comes down to the schedule in this divisionless era. So much of your success year over year is just going to come down to whether or not you have to play those like gorillas in your conference. Yeah. Like no, no Alabama, no Georgia. That is a, this is a green light year. This is a get it kind of season. You know, in the ACC right now, that's Clemson and Florida state in uh, the big 10. That's going to be, it's Ohio state and Michigan. And maybe we'll throw Oregon into that mix as well. Like if, if Mike Elko is inheriting a Texas A&M team that is not going to have to play Alabama or Georgia, he has a great chance to make a good first impression with the Aggies. 100%. Um, now his immediate thing is going to be, is Connor Wegman the quarterback you want? Right. If not, you need to get on the Riley Leonard thing if he hits the portal and, and do so fast, which he may not hit the portal. Like This is just rampant speculation, but um, I mean, he's going to have a pretty nice NIL opportunity out there if he does, I assume. And then you need to figure out, like, okay, Evan Stewart. Evan Stewart didn't travel to the LSU game, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of rumors out there about him portaling. We'll see, right? You know, if you're if if this Elko thing ends up being 100, percent and they announce it, which maybe they already have by the time we've been on air here. Don't know. I, I hope they don't do another stoops on this, right? If if so, this will be one of the most epic episodes we've, we've ever done. Uh, you need to get Evan Stewart back in the fold, right? I believe Anaya Smith has another year he can use if he wants it. Like, can you talk to him? That they have some real weapons on this team. Uh, Noah's a really nice player. The offensive line played a little better down the stretch, actually. Like in the final couple games, I know it was Ole Miss, but like they pushed out, they pushed around Ole Miss. They played okay against LSU. They played decently against Mississippi State. I don't know what that was against Abilene Christian. The, the all the pressures they allowed there, but I mean. Like, there's a lot of important guys that you have to keep on this roster. And that's got to be part of it too, right? Like, hey, we paid all this money for this recruiting class. Let's bring back the guy who helped recruit it and see if he can keep him in the fold. Ooh. Yeah, somebody was saying that just we're dealing with an expensive operation right now, just trying to you know get all the money moving around with what it takes to get Jimbo Fisher out, get new head coach in, get old staff out, get new staff in. At least when you're dealing with Mike Elko for a lot of these big money boosters that are cutting checks, they know him. Like yeah. sim simply put, they they know him. So they are um they are very obviously comfortable here uh moving forward with Mike Elko. Um any anything else from this before we hit the break? And and by the way, there was a, a lot that happened. We're gonna save a majority of the breakdown at, at Houston, at um, Indiana. You know, so, some of the other pieces that we have on the coaching carousel, as well as some of the other jobs which are, look like they could be nearing closer to completion. We're gonna do a lot of that uh, for Monday. An extra special coaching carousel edition of Upon Further Review. Uh, anything else on the Texas A and M side for right now before we hit a break and then. Uh, Look how Duke moves forward. No, I, I, I'm excited to see. I, I really do think there is a chance that uh, two things. One, I think the number of coaches who said thanks but no thanks to this tells you that a and is not a top five job. Not it's yet. It's not a top five job. Well, I, not no. in my opinion. No. Like I, to me, it's it's a clear somewhere. If you really want to stretch it, between like seven and sixteen ish. You know, it's one of those jobs. Clearly, even though they haven't, they could win a national title because of the resources, mm -hmm. you know, got to the right guy also have to admit that there are certain things that like we can't, we can't see, but we have to admit they're probably there that have prevented you from doing so for like a hundred years. Right. Um, but also, man, like the last two guys they've had there 
at times won some games and had some major stuff going on that has nothing to do with the university. And if you get a guy that just has his stuff together, I think they got some real potential, man. And I yep. think Elko has his stuff together. Yep. Whew. And listen, now, now we get to the tough part because coming up on the other side, what's next for the Duke Blue Devils uh, in terms of looking for a replacement for Mike Elko? Plus, also live in this moment, Looks like Jeff Levy to Mississippi State might be close to completion. So, look, uh, what's next for Duke? More coaching carousel thoughts uh, here on this emergency podcast. Much more next. A game of honor. The Army-Navy game presented by USAA. Saturday, December 9th on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. These emergency podcasts trying to run ads and talk. Jordan does a lot for this show. Appreciate all that he does. I'm sure he's listening to this. All right, so the Duke, um, the the Duke head coaching position, last time it was available, they went and made a great hire. You know, they got Mike Hilko. They got the the man who is currently being offered the Texas A and M head coach job. How do you go find another Mike Elko right now? Doesn't Cutcliffe and Elko being there and succeeding make it a little bit easier to, to make the hire? Yes. Yeah. Like it's Especially not the Duke, right now. It's not the Duke we grew up with. Right. Right. Like the, the Duke we grew up with, you know, and um, we're both almost 40, right? So, I mean, the Duke we, we grew up with from 1990 to 2007 went to one bowl game. Oh, and it was 1994. I think it was like the yeah. only one. And there would be seasons where they did not win an ACC game. Yeah. Like they, I mean, winless, one, two, three, four, shoot, chip, like 12 times in that span. Yeah. Like that's, yeah, that, and, and and one win, one, two, three, four, other, yeah. Not, not a lot of winning going on there. And so that is the Duke that most coaches out there grew up with. But I do think recent changes by, by Duke, committing to football more, right? It, it, I think it's a better job than it once was. I think Duke is a better job than Syracuse. I agree. I mean, they, they're both private schools. Duke seems to have its act together better from the administration uh, than than Syracuse does. Duke, I think, might have more NIL to play with than Syracuse does. Like, they seem to – they're clearly in a better spot to recruit uh, than Syracuse is. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see who they hire. I don't have a big list of names for this one right now. Like, my, immediately, I think Johns has done an excellent job there. So, again, the superior knowledge idea. Do you know that this guy's really good? Mm -hmm. You've been around him for a while. If so, maybe hire him. Is there somebody who we should be thinking about to get that job? Pat Fitzgerald. It is challenging, right? Like, like it, it's it's a job where you can't get just anybody into school. Like academics do matter there. Like, and you and you have to get guys who can pass classes. Willie Fritz. Oh. All 15 or 16 other ACC coaches would hate that, but he would do a good job there. He would do a really good job. Uh, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Because then you're also running the, the like, a little bit unique on offense. You can kind of mix and match. You're not you're not worried about having to go in and just, just line it up and smash heads with uh, the biggest and strongest teams in the conference. And Willie, Willie Fritz might be, uh, might be one. That... Nina, I know that uh, Duke Athletic Director Nina King is a big fan of the Cover 3 podcast. I know you listen, so, you know. Um, yeah, Nina, I, I'm sure you're already ahead of it because you're, you know, uh, incredibly savvy at this process. But dude, I'm with you. I think the administration values football. And when you are at Duke, you need to know that everybody is aligned behind making sure that football is not going to fall behind and that you are competing at whatever level – we're at that you are competing at a level um, that is not, you know, an, an embarrassment in any sense. So, you know, you are in the ACC, you are making bowl games, and every couple of years you cycle up and you can go toe to toe. Like your best teams do give you a shot to maybe go make a run at the ACC championship, but the floor is not, you know, these three win, two win type seasons. 
the expectation with the way that Duke is aligned and has prioritized making sure that football um, you know, is strong, that that is something that I think Willie Fritz could absolutely be doing where making bowl games regularly and cycle up every couple of years to, uh, to maybe compete for an ACC title. Schedule for Duke next year at Northwestern, host UConn at Middle Tennessee, host FSU, host North Carolina, host SMU, host Virginia Tech, at Georgia Tech, at Miami, at NC State, at Wake. I would say that is a – it's not a tougher schedule than they had this year on paper because this year you got Notre Dame, Clemson, FSU. Right. There's not a ton of gimmies there, though. At SMU doesn't play around in the transfer portal, and they have some NIL to throw around, right? I, I mean, Brent Pry may, has the Hokies back in a bowl game now, so uh, it's not a it's not a, an automatic bowl team every year. You, like taking Duke to a bowl should still be considered a, an accomplishment, in my opinion. Uh, but I agree, they're not this two win, three win type program anymore. It, it has elevated because of their commitment to it. I think. Um. um. Any uh, any any thought on uh, Mississippi State locking in Jeff Levy? Um, we can we can elaborate more uh, tomorrow no, when, I, when we link up. I mean, look clearly, like like let's think about the things that we said. You need a guy with head coaching experience, probably doesn't have that. Um, you know, he's been around a lot of successful head coaches, certainly. So you know, there is that. You need to run something that is different than the rest of the league runs, in my opinion, on offense. You need to be a tough prep. And Mississippi State fans don't like this, but when you put your hands up to vote, not you the fans, your administration, when they say yes to voting in Missouri and Texas A&M and Texas and Oklahoma, you are voting for more losses on your record, regardless of who you hire. It's just the facts. Because those programs are all better than your program. So you need to find a coach who can basically have people kind of asleep at the wheel twice a year when they play you to try to steal some wins. Could, you know, does Levy's offense fit that? Yeah, I think so. Obviously, there's you know, some concerning stuff in the background. Uh, you know, but like, if you're Mississippi State, a lot of other schools have hired these guys. You know, that doesn't necessarily make, make it right, but it's also... Are you talking about the Brile stuff? Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean... And the and the Brawl stuff, just to be but, clear, for but those Art not, has not like, gotten hired anywhere. Like yeah, there like seems to be a, a line as far as like, okay, definitely not that our our compliance people and other people have cleared these guys. Like multiple times. Like how, how many different places have they worked since there? So if you're Mississippi State, you know, it it's sort of like if you can stomach it, like it it, it your 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 admin's gonna clear it. Basically. Right. It's it was so the most recent, you know, like he he had art at Oklahoma practice. Was that it? And everybody got upset. I think it was like on the field post game, right? Okay. I don't, I, I don't have that, you know, specifically called up, but oh, for, for me, the concern about Jeff Levy would be the fact that while he is, you know, widely regarded as a very strong offensive mind, it really does feel like we are just totally unknown in terms of him running the show because a lot of these and look you know he was with a, a first or a second year coach now in Brent Venables but a lot of his other stops have been with head coaches who are very big personalities and run you know do it their way like this is going to be really interesting to see you know what Jeff Levy is able to do um with his first opportunity i mean it's you got to get hired at some point to be able to have a shot and so I'm I'm very curious to uh, to see what Mississippi State is going to do because maybe it works. Like it, yeah, it could be that you know he is up in the the big chair as the big voice in the room. He's able to hire a really good staff and, and they get a lot of buy in. They're really tough, and if they're out there with that kind of you know that offense that just absolutely like keeps defenses on their heels, sells tickets, keeps fans excited and engaged that's something that can win like that. That can be a, a good tenure uh, for Jeff Levy at Mississippi state. Just a total question mark in terms of what to expect uh, on all these other decisions that he has to make that aren't three by one X Z Y, you know, like <laughs> that aren't the uh, very explicit offensive stuff. 
I, I think that a lot of coaches said thanks, but no, no thanks. To Mississippi State, too. Yes. So Texas yeah. A&M and Mississippi State are probably both dealing with the scenario where they had an SEC wallet to open up, but a lot of coaches looked at the job and was like, I'd, I'd rather not leave my current situation to, to go do that. Yeah, and I, I think if, if you're taking Mississippi State, I mean, you have to – there has to be a conversation with your family. Hey, we're going to get mega rich off this. And it is a J-O-B job because the chances are I get fired in four years. But I'm going to bank 25-ish million before taxes, guaranteed money. Okay. You know, like that sets my family up for life. Like fans don't think about jobs that way, but coaches sometimes have to. Right. And I mean, like that, isn't that schedule next year insane for them? I I, I mean, every time the SEC expands back to your voting um, reference. Every single time the SEC is expanding, Mississippi State's schedule is getting more difficult. Um, All right, so they, they 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 get the three auto wins in the non-con: Eastern, Toledo, UMass, and then are at Arizona State. So like that's probably four, but it could be three and one. Uh, and then no Vandy uh, on the SEC. They get Georgia, Arkansas, Florida, Missouri, A and M, Ole Miss, Tennessee, Texas. They better do some serious work in the portal because the last two years of recruiting, I don't think have been great, to be honest, not by SEC standards. Uh, to circle back on Duke Signetti. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was about to say, like, we've covered three tailgates coming through with some good ones. Kurt Signetti from James Madison. That would give me, I'd give that a thumbs up. Sean Clark at App. It, it makes sense. I think he's done a really good job with this team this year. Um, uh, he's 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 also kind of a nap lifer, right? I yeah. mean, I maybe I'm being biased with the, my analysis of like I don't know. I'd like for him to just stay at app. Sean Clark's family is probably like, hey, you know what we would like the power conference paycheck. So, um, you know, we'll see. Jeff uh, Jeff Trailer could be at Houston now that Dana is out. That would be something definitely to keep an eye on. Jamie Chadwell to Duke. That'd be interesting. Uh, I, I mean, Chadwell turned down Mississippi State. So, but like you can, it's clear that Chadwell values stability. I mean, I, I think last year, like he could have had Georgia Tech or USF had he wanted it, but he took a job. Like they're going to win the league. Would you say, like, decidedly more than half the time at Conference USA at Liberty if Chadwell stays there and the commitment to resources stays the same? Oh, no, we're going to be talking about like, like a Bowden. First, yeah, like, I, I was ACC. gonna say like take take the Clemson Florida State run when it was just like from eleven to twenty one. Either Florida State or Clemson was winning it, it a, a decade. Yeah. yeah, so it's gonna be something similar to that. Like it it'll be Liberty or it'll be someone else, but half the time it, it'll be Liberty. Liberty will be there every single time. Yes, and it's just you know will they win the game? Probably comes down to injuries. Totally. If the quarterback stays healthy, Liberty's going to win at least six titles in the next 10 years in that league, probably more. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know if, I, if, if uh, Jamie Chadwell would take Duke. I, I mean, I think Duke's a, a pretty good job. Um, man, but if you're Chadwell, you can be pretty patient. And that's the, that, that's the beauty of taking that Liberty job. Because mm -hmm. like South Carolina could open next year. Like, I don't think Tennessee's going to open, but that's obviously one of the industry things is kind of circled there. You know, could NC State or UNC open? I mean, what what's the odds that both of those don't open after next year? I, he's also only been at Liberty one year, right? And there is something to be said. Like, I know it's a Power 5 job, but it is a pain to tell your staff, hey, pack up, we're moving, got to move all our families and stuff. And it happens. Like, you do it because the money's that good, but it's still like, like, that does disrupt people's lives who work for you. So you right. can't just willy nilly take a job, a different job every year. Like the, the, there are real people that like family concerns to this type of thing. Mm. Um, I don't know. Jerry kill. Probably not. I, um, I think Jerry kills a little rough around the edges for Duke. Yeah. I was just reading. Through, reading and I, through the, I say uh, that lovingly, like this is somebody who has celebrated uh, Jerry kills full arm tat to celebrate bowl eligibility at the end of the 2022 season. Like I'm, it is badass, and he is awesome. We are a pro Jerry kill podcast. A little rough around the edges for that 
coaches show at the country club at the Washington Duke Inn. Is that where it's at? It used to be. I okay. I've, I haven't listened to it, um, but that was always where my friend, uh, where where the excuse me, the, the excellent Art Chase uh, used to hold it down with David Cutcliffe. Nice, I love that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know who Houston should hire. I, I, I I'm curious as to what level of support that job has. I'm not saying Dana did a good job there. Like I, I don't think he did, but he did kind of shepherd that program into the Big Twelve. Mm-hmm. They won a couple Big Twelve games, right? Or just one? They played Texas close. They played Texas Tech pretty close. They hung with UCF a little better than I thought they were going to hang with. Oh, them. they beat West Virginia on that hail mary. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so uh, like, how many Big Twelve level players do you think you have there at, at Houston? What What is the rebuild like? Um, I All just the- love that he was spout that Dana Holgerson was spouting off about his big ass buyout. Uh, he's not going anywhere because he's got all these double digit win seasons and he's got a big buyout. And then somebody at Houston was like, you're right. You do. And here it is. Do you think we have a, a uh, an opening tomorrow at Syracuse or, or, or oh, do you think it's, it's, it's going to be going to fill? I think it's going to fill tomorrow. With Mullen. Maybe. Okay. Buddy, I was watching the end of, uh, college football final and Matt Barry did a funny like he and because it was like oh no something on the coaching carousel and now we wait and he like did like a big oversized dramatic like head turn right to Mullen and like Galloway laughed a little bit and I was like either they are making light of the reports or yeah they've this is it, that would be another one like El to AM where I was like nah like I, my misread on vibes of whether a coach would leave what they are doing right now for another job is, has not been spot on, and that's okay. It's not my I'm not doing locks on the coaching carousel. He uh he also if you watch the Miami Boston College game it was it was him and Mullen and he was kind of jabbing. He's like, Dan, do you think you look good in orange? You you, you look good in orange when you were at Florida. <laughs> Just it was it was pretty funny. I, I thought he did a good job with it. So maybe. Um, the the chat seems uh, cover three tailgate seems to think the uh, the Holy Cross guy with all the exodus of Holy Cross players is probably probably a sign there. Uh, probably a sign because all, all the Holy Cross players are jumping in the transfer portal because and that'd be yeah. Bob Chesney. He's done a really good job. That'd be a that would not be the the splashy interesting hire that uh, that that gives us somebody like we're not going to be spending as much time getting our laughs in about Bob Chesney. Because we don't know him like we know Dan Mullen. We've got extensive, intimate experience covering Dan Mullen. It's going to take us a while. Sometimes there is an element of like, hey, uh, it's easier to hire a football coach when you don't have insane boosters and you can just go hire a good football coach. Right? Mm -hmm. I I don't know. Um, I think that's the only opening. Oregon State, we'll have to see. We already talked about Michigan State last night. If Iowa was going to open, I don't think it'll open before the Big the Big Ten championship game. Obviously, same with Alabama. Yeah, exactly. Um, I don't know, man. I have to kind of uh, kind of have to sit tight there. Uh, UCLA still haven't heard anything there. Still haven't heard anything there. We'll see. Yeah. Monday morning, 11 a.m. Eastern time. A very special coaching carousel edition of a pun further review. I mean, a lot of this is us putting our final stamp on a season for some of these teams, for some of these coaches. So uh, we'll get started. All the latest from the coaching carousel and so much more. And you can follow him on Twitter at BudL83. You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Bud, thank you very much. See you, buddy. I've got to end it.